Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Gaia Community. We are an Earth-based pagan Unitarian Universalist congregation. We meet every Sunday uh, here once again at 4327 Troost uh, and online wherever you happen to be. And today is our second week of many rituals that are, is part of our patron selection process for our annual patron uh, for 2022 to 2023. So if you were here last week, you heard from uh, temples representing Persephone and Lu and Ariadne and Xochipilli. And today uh, you will hear from temples representing Hecate, the world tree, Prometheus and Ma'at. At the uh, end of our, after uh, today's ritual, um, and after it has an opportunity to go to our uh, YouTube channel so that folks who aren't able to be with us today can watch it, uh, we're going to hold a ranked choice vote and choose our patron for the year from that field of eight powers. So uh, today is an exciting day to learn more about the other half of our field. So thank you all for joining us. I would like to remind everybody uh, whether you are here in the space with me or whether you are at home uh, to make minimize your distractions. So if you have a cell phone or other technological device, please make sure that it is set to uh, what the Unitarian Universalist Hysterical Society calls the most reverent setting, which is silent. So we'll get started here in just a moment. Uh, I am your host for today. I'm Kimberly and you will also be seeing today Kitty and Devin and Matt and Jamie. And we are assisted uh, by David who is running our tech today. So thank you to all of those folks. I'm gonna to begin today by lighting a chalice and our chalice lighting this week is call and response. If you were with us last week, you had an opportunity to practice it then. So we're going to do it again today. Um, the title of this piece is In This Sacred Space, and that is also your line. So I'm gonna say a line and I'm going to ask you to respond to me by saying, in this sacred space. We gather together. In this sacred space. Let us be still in the quiet. Space. Let our hearts open as butterfly wings. Space. May the glow of this light shine within us. Blessed be. Blessed be. So once again, today we will take a trip uh, in the landscape of the sacred imagination to that temple of many powers that we established last week. So I invite you to take a moment to prepare yourself for that journey. Begin with a deep breath. and continue to breathe slowly and evenly, letting yourself relax, letting yourself consider, how do you feel today? What values matter to you? What are you seeking in matters of spiritual kinship What needs do you seek to have fulfilled by this community? Which values and works put forward by these powers do you think will help best help Gaia community become a place that will serve those needs for you and for others? As you think upon these things, let me remind you, your needs are valid, 
and value. This selection process has as its goal the meeting of the most spiritual needs of the most members. But it in no way requires you to form a relationship with any of these powers. That's up to you. So I invite you today to participate at a level that feels comfortable to you. And to simply be present to the work that we do today. Keeping the stewardship of yourself and your belief in the good of others in your mind, I invite you to settle into a comfortable position. I invite you here in this space or in your own home to focus on the flame of this chalice to continue to breathe deeply, watching this single point of light as it moves and dances, as it glows and grows. Let this point of light become the center of your attention and let it fill that field of your focus letting it burn away distractions and concerns, letting it brighten, filling your awareness. And I invite you to become aware of the sacredness of the space around you, the inherent sacredness of all places on the earth, all spaces where we gather. In this space, we will build a temple of our thoughts, our intentions, our imaginings, and our will. We construct around us this temple to many powers. It is a place you may have visited before or you may be visiting today for the first time. Allow your inner eye to see this temple around us. Allow your inner ears to hear its sounds as we build this temple together. I invite you to share your vision with the group. And I ask that when someone speaks aloud, some quality that this temple has, that you add that to the visualization you build, bringing us together in the space of intention. What do you see when you look at this temple? What do you see around us? Pillars of stability. Pillars of stability. A large open area surrounded by small temples on all sides. What details do you notice? Intricate carvings. Intricate carvings. Light of birds. Flicker of candles. Flicker of candles. Beautiful art. Many textures, uses of color. Trees that shade us. As you look around, what do you see or experience that lets you know that this space is sacred? Is 
spiritual symbols. Spiritual symbols. Sense of history. Sense of history. People talking together quietly. People coming together to worship and to learn. What do you see that tells you there is magic here, there is power here? We are in the presence of the divine. Candles. Sense of awe. Burning candles. Sense of awe. Sound of chanting. Sound of chanting. Images of deity or representation of deity. In this holy place that we imagine together, let us be present. Let us do our work. In this place of power and protection, we establish our connections to the many ways, the many worlds. We establish our connection to many powers. So would it be? Today, as we travel between the shrines and the temple of many powers, those of you who are coming to us from afar may have some visual disturbance. So I invite you now to take a moment, perhaps close your eyes, focus in on this vision that we share together as we move towards the temple of Hekat. Welcome to the temple of Hekate. I understand our goddess is under consideration for becoming your patron for the coming year. I'm Kitty, one of the priestesses here, and I will be your guide for this tour of the temple and hopefully answer the questions you might have. So let's start with some background on the lineage of our goddess. As you may know, Hecate is a direct descendant of the mother of us all our wondrous earth, Gaia. But this can be verified in the writings of the Greek historian Hesiod. In fact, Gaia is Hecate's great-grandmother on both sides of her family tree. With Uranus, heaven, Gaia birthed Phoebe, that's Hecate's maternal grandmother, who birthed Asteria, that's Hecate's mother, uh, who's also the sister of Lita, who birthed Artemis and Apollo. Now going to the other side of the family, with Pontus, the sea, Gaia birthed Eurybia. That's Hecate's paternal grandmother, who then birthed Persis, who's her father. So as you can see, Hecate's great grandparents are the three domains associated with her. Earth, Gaia, heaven, Oronos, and sea, or Pontus. So we can hear this in Hesiod's own words. Hecate, whom Zeus, the son of Kronos, honored above all, he gave her splendid gifts to have a share of the earth and the unfruitful sea. She received honor also in starry heaven and is honored exceedingly by the deathless gods. For as many were born of Gaia and Oranos, amongst all these, she has her due portion. The son of Kronos, that's Zeus, did her no wrong, nor took anything away of all that was her fortune among the former Titan gods. 
but she holds, as the division was at first, from the beginning, privilege both in earth and in heaven and in sea. Also, because she is an only child, the goddess receives not less honor, but much more still, for Zeus honors her. Our goddess Hecta, Hecate, was worshipped widely throughout the Hellenistic world. At uh, Lagaina, near the town of Stratomichaea in southwestern Turkey, the Carians built a massive temple for Hecate. You can see some pictures of it behind me. She was their protectress and civic goddess. They even imprinted her image on their coins. Other prominent cult centers for Hecate were at Eleusis and the island of Samothrace. In Athens and other parts of Greece, people built small shrines to Hecate at crossroads and at doorways. In fact, the playwright Aristophanes mentioned the popularity of court shrines dedicated to Hecate in one of his plays. These smaller shrines were erected to ward off evil and protect the household and individual from witchcraft. However, since Hecate was a goddess of magic, you often hear her petitioned, along with Hermes, for assistance in wreaking justice on thieves and other evil doers. According to Pausanias, the Greek traveler and geographer of the second century AD, the first statue showing Hecate has three forms, uh, such as in this picture, stood next to the temple of Nike on the Parthenon in Athens. Now, you might be interested to note that depictions of Hecate before the 20th century ordinarily show her as a young woman or a lady of indeterminate age. She takes on many forms, single, triple, and sometimes zoomorphic, uh, having the heads of different animals. Hecate is even named as the mother of the sea monster Scylla, as well as the sorceresses Kirky and Medea. But regardless of being a mother, she seems to have maintained her maiden status. Now, speaking of the 20th century, or, or rather the 21st century, worship of Hecate has witnessed a stunning resurgence. According to a May 2021 Wild Hunt article, she is now a towering presence on the global spiritual landscape and in popular culture as well. Now, this is a strong reason to consider her for your patron. In addition to everything that's been written about her in ancient times, there is an increasing amount of resources to provide guidance and ritual material, including books and websites and groups, and even an organization called the Covenant of Hecate. Hecate is a goddess who crosses over boundaries and rules liminal places. And for these and other reasons, Hecate is a guardian for the marginalized. And as Hecate Korotropos, she is a protector of children. And you all have been guardians of the marginalized as well. Now, before we enter the temple, I want to bring your attention to this plate of food. This is her dipnon, or monthly supper offering. The dipnon fell on the close of the lunar month. It was a time for moving and removing any bad or stale energy, sometimes called miasma, one didn't want to carry forward into the next lunar month. While the main purpose of the dipnon was to honor Hecate and to placate the souls in her wake who longed for vengeance, a secondary purpose was to purify the household and to atone for bad deeds, a household member may have committed to defend Hecate, causing her to withhold her favor from them. Homes were swept clean, purifying herbs such as bay, laurel, lavender, and rosemary were burned, and at dusk, the supper was laid out. Breads, cakes, fruits, cheeses, garlic, onion, eggs, fish, sesame seeds, almonds, and libations of wine and honey were common offerings. Her devotees would place these offerings outside their homes during the new moon. However, these weren't just a means of giving her offerings, but also a subtle 
or not so subtle way to provide food for the homeless and hungry. It was a known fact that people who were in need would eat the offerings. They weren't just offerings to the goddess, but also a means of providing her an offering by helping others. And while a few frowned upon this, it became quite acceptable to do so. In fact, here's a quote from a play by Aristophanes. Ask Hecate whether it is better to be rich or starving. She will tell you that the rich send her meal every month and the poor make it disappear before it is even served. So as a social justice activity for your congregation, feeding the hungry would be something Hecate would encourage. All right, now let's enter the temple proper now. Uh, you can see it is lit by torches. These represent the torches that Pate carries when she leads Persephone to and from the underworld each year. Hecate also carried a torch when she met the meter. Uh, I'm more sure you're familiar with this story, how Hades, the lord of the underworld, fell in love with Persephone, the maiden daughter of Demeter, and knowing that Demeter would not give her consent, Hades conspired with Zeus, the girl's father, to kidnap Persephone. Hades was successful in taking her to his kingdom to become his wife and queen. And Demeter was horribly distraught over the disappearance of her daughter and took to wandering the earth for nine days. And finally, on the tenth day, Demeter spoke to Hecate. But when the tenth enlightening dawn had come, Hecate, with a torch in her hands, met her and spoke to her and told her the news. Queenly Demeter, bring her a seasons and give her good gifts. What god of heaven or what mortal man has wrapped away Persephone and pierced with sorrow your dear heart? For I heard her voice, yet saw not with my eyes who it was, but I tell you truly and shortly all I know. Hecate then accompanies Demeter to Helios, who tells her that her daughter is with Hades. Hermes, the messenger god, travels to Hades and returns Persephone to her mother. However, Hades had persuaded her to eat one or more pomegranate seeds, and as a result, she has to return to Hades for a third or half of every year. On her return, Hecate embraces Persephone and becomes her companion and her guide from that time, being both her preceder and her follower. And by being both in front of and behind Persephone, Hecate takes the role of both protector and guide toward the queen of Hades. So this is a role she can take for us in our communities, helping us find our way into and out of difficult situations, lighting and helping us follow the path. All right, so let's move on to our statue of Hecate, and we'll look at the symbolism it contains. So we'll make a small offering. First, a cake. some cinnamon, some chocolate, and some wine. Hecate Enodia, Trioditas, lovely dame of earthly water and celestial flame, Sufficol, Sepulchral, in a saffron veil arrayed, pleased with dark ghosts that wander through the shade. Perseids, solitary goddess, hail. The world's key bearer, never doomed to fail, in stags rejoicing, huntress, nightly seen and drawn by bulls, unconquerable queen, leader, nymph, nurse on mountains wandering, hear the suppliants who home rights thy power reveal, and to the herdsman with a favoring mind. Oh. Hell, <laughs> so here is a replica of our temple's statue to the cup. And as you can see, she carries a torch, the light uh, to light the way, both for Persephone and for us. She brings light into the darkness. One of Hecate's most uh, main epithets 
is phosphorus, light grid, and Hakate illuminating the darkness with her torches. The torch is a symbol of divine light and illumination. In her other hand, she holds a dagger. In literature, Richard's cut herbs with bronze daggers and in necromancy, magic daggers are used to control spirits or to protect against evil spirits. And it also symbolizes her ability to end life and to assist in giving life by cutting the umbilical cord at birth. On Hecate's forehead is an owl. Some say it represents the embodiment of her will. Others say that it is her messenger or a symbol of occult wisdom. Its connection with Hecate is more modern. Around her hips, Hecate wears a belt from which hangs keys. She also carries the title Pleidushos, key bearer. And from her temple in Lagarna, key bearing processions were held down the sacred way to the nearby city. Hecate is also linked to doorways, gateways, and entrance ways. And these are liminal points which a person passes from inside to outside and where a key might be needed. Hecate's keys are said to be the keys that open the gate to Hades. And keys symbolize freedom, protection, and transition. So accompanying Hecate are two dogs. See them here. One story goes that the queen of Troy, uh, Hecate, committed suicide, and Hecate took pity on her, turned her into a dog, who then became her companion and protector. And the sound of dogs barking is often given as an announcement of Hecate's presence. Another uh, animal undeniably significant to Hecate is the snake. And a snake wraps around her arm here, and there is a snake traveling up her spine in the back, uh, deities or spirits who are invoked for magic and spells are habitually accompanied by snakes, and they're also a symbol of healing. Other animals associated with Hecate are horse, cow, bull, polecat, and boar. And so another social justice outlet when working with Hecate would be helping animals, such as at an animal shelter, or a greyhound rescue, or a wildlife rescue. Uh, and by the way, racehorse owners Race horse owners would pray and make offerings to Hecate, asking that their horses win and other horses fail. She was often called upon to help one with games of any kind. And I'm going to skip what Hesiod said because we need to be moving on. Now, if you look at the items at Hecate's feet, you'll see a skull representing her connection to the underworld and also the pumpkins, which uh, are associated with Saturn, and she has become associated with that festival as well. And speaking of festivals and holidays, Hecate is associated with the darker new moon. We talked about the Nephmon, uh, and the Greeks are said to honor Hecate on August 13th and November 30th. The Romans took every 29th of the month as a day sacred to her. August 25th is the festival, festival of Heraclitus. This is an ancient day of rituals honoring Hecate as the guardian of children. And a modern festival, the Rite of the Sacred Fires, is an international devotional event celebrated each year during the May full moon. Now, Hecate has numerous, probably hundreds of epithets, titles for her including things like of the underworld, averter of evil, torchbearer, soothing one, night wanderer, companion or god, savior or world soul. But one of my favorites is Ephodia, traveling expenses, provisions for the road, traveling supplies and resources. <laughs> Just what you need when you're going on a trip. So, just Take a moment, if you would, I want to pause. And if you take a few breaths and close your eyes, let's take a moment to reach out to Hecate ourselves. And just ask her 
help you whatever challenge or problem you might be facing. Whether it's something just this moment or farther in the future. Imagine her coming to you. Asking her whatever you wish. Asking for her. So I'm sorry that was so short, our time is so minimal, but let me wrap up. So why should Akate be your congregation's patron in the coming year? Well, she is a powerful goddess with power over heaven and earth and sea. And there are events happening in our country, in our city, in our states, in our world where power is useful. She is wise. She listens. If you or your congregation are approaching a crossroad, she can provide light and discernment. She understands difficult choices. If you've been feeling stuck in dark places, she can lead you out. If you need to explore your darkness, she can lead you in and stay with you while you're there. She rules magic and witchcraft. She's the protectress of marginalized people, of women, of children, of the household, and of doorways. Thank you for considering her as your patron. Hecate Sotiera, thank you for granting your wisdom to us this day. Hail Hecate. Thank you again. Leave the temple of Hecate, I invite you once again. Close your eyes and imagine that journey. To our next shrine. Where we encounter the world shrine. It is at this point that I practice what I was about to preach.
Would anyone be offended by being light and see? Can you all hear me? Yes? I like this merely because it smells nice. Even through my eyes. Trees are not one thing. They're multitudes. They vary from topping out a few feet above our grass to the sequoia hypera, which reaches a staggering 380 feet tall. What we call trees have evolved from different plant ancestors dozens of times. And that's just what we know. And just as many times, lineages have grown small again. They are mighty, majestic towers and share resources amongst each other. Through fungi and the forest floor. While still, compared to our own frame of reference, the one thing they are not, static. The same can be said for the sacred tree that connects all things. Amongst the cultural inheritors of the Indo-Europeans, it is the exception when there is not a place in the Lord for a tree that connects the realms of above and below with us between them. Whether it be just three worlds, seven, nine, or any other number, the sacred tree would become the species of the people that they know best. The beliefs indigenous to classical China and the Korean Peninsula have many instances of trees connecting to the heavens or holding up various heavenly bodies. Mesoamerican codices and carvings are filled with the world tree image, again, connecting the below world to the above, to the place in between. These date back at least 3,000 years from our time and likely longer than we have not yet found. The Opong tribe of Tanzania even has their creation myth centered around their version of a world tree. This myth, I hesitate to say, belongs from the collect comes from the collective unconscious, but other people have. This is a near universal thing. These are just a sample of the recorded references that we have. For this next part, we'll do a bit of a meditation. So please get comfortable. Sit, stand, if you're at home, lie down. I believe this should take about 10 minutes. I want you to envision the tree that you are most comfortable with. The type that you see most often in your head. The platonic thing that says tree to you. Note where this tree is. What's around it? Trees do not exist in vacuums. Is this tree healthy? What lives in its branches? Do squirrels skitter about? Do feathered friends flutter? 
who binds and tangles themselves upon its trunk. How is the bark? Is it smooth? Is it coarse? Is it sticky? Does it flake? Is this the type of tree that loses its leaves every year? Mm -hmm. Or do they stick around? Does this tree provide shade? Does it keep you cool? Or does the sun reach through its branches? Does the wind make any noise going through this tree? Should it? Does the air change around this tree? Is your world cleaner because of it? Does it give off an essence that you can almost taste? This is the world tree as you see it now, today, for you. Tomorrow, it may be different. Focus your mind on the trunk of this tree. Visualize the rings of growth within it. Bring your awareness closer to the center the heartwood of the tree and see what the tree looked like but it's just sap is the environment different if so what has changed go back further watch the rings become a seed that falls from its mother tree How did the seed get back to where you found it? What different things live in this mother tree? What surrounds this ancestral? In what context does it matter? Is this tree healthy? Or are the seeds that it spreads its last hope, its last push of life to continue on? Do you feel comfortable with the state of this tree? When you're ready, follow the seed back, back to your tree, back to the momentary now. Pause for a moment for breath. <clears throat> and now watch as time passes beyond us here. 
Observe your true self. As time moves forward, beyond the now, does it flower? Does it fruit? The seeds get cast. As seasons pass, how does it look? Does it grow strong? <coughs> or is it toward the center? As is the way of all things. How long does your tree stand? And when it is gone, what takes its place? What happens to the thing that is no longer a tree? What light fills that hole? Forward one last little bit. Does another tree come up? The humans come and replenish it. Does life find a way? When you're ready again. Follow me back to the map. Let the connections to all things, let the connections to this truth slip back below your awareness again. Remember that you are human, that you breathe, that you have a name. Say it if need be. Breathe deep, stretch if you need to. The next bit is also contemplative, but not a meditation. If the world tree is patron for a year, guys should focus on caring for the earth and each other because our lives depend on it. That can mean assisting each other with fast reminders, cooking for each other, carpooling to any event, or just in general, sharing what we have in abundance and asking for what we need. Not just for our pledging members, but for all of our extended network. A forest of trees thrives when diverse trees share what they have. The world tree asks that we respect the interdependent web of all existence, of which we are a part. In particular, we should reflect upon every aspect of what we consume and how we interact with the greater world and act in the most sustainable way. This could mean that we avoid using paper or plastic when possible. It could also mean you find a group that needs help rather than do a social justice activity on our own. Or we just continue our social justice work from this current but maybe with added effort, like leading a team for Blue River Rescue. Finally, the World Tree asks that in honoring our mission and covenant state of modeling and teaching sustainable living in an urban and rural context, we consider something like displaying the year 
in a Y10K container. For those of you who do not, that would be putting a zero in front of the year of our dates. Or we create other environments. So the other environments that where that where we are now is only one spot on a continuum. We should plant trees who shade. You may never know. In short, the world tree is not asked for vast specific things. Merely that we become as interconnected and help each other as much as possible. You leave the temple of the world tree. I ask that you once again take a deep breath, take a moment, perhaps close your eyes. As we proceed further into our temple of all work, our temple of all powers, visit with three. And to truly begin at the beginning, we start in darkness, in memory of the chaos of the void, the realm of infinite possibility where all things began. But to make sense of the shifting shadows of infinity is a lifetime of work. So let us skip ahead a little. After the war with the Titans had been won, the brothers Prometheus and Epimetheus were granted a boon by the king of the gods. They were tasked with creating the vast creatures of the world and disseminated the gifts of the gods to them. And as a special gift, they were tasked with the creation of a thinking being capable of praising the gods of the world that they were given to live in. Prometheus left much of the work of the animal kingdom to his brother and focused on this latter quest, seeking among him the earth herself and the clay that was found there to form a shape in the village of the immortal gods, softening it with his tears to help shape it. But unable to give it life, he reached out to Athena, goddess of wisdom, who with her breath imbued them with life. And Prometheus sought a gift for this special creation. But when he visited the sword given to them by the gods, he found that Epimetheus had already bestowed the powerful claws, the sharp teeth, the eyes that see at night, the thick hides, the heavy fur coats to protect you from the elements, had all been given out. But he did not wish to leave this special creation without a gift. So he sought among things remaining to the gods, to give something to this creation of humanity. And passing by the heart of Hestia, he saw it quiet. This would be incredibly special. This would raise humanity to thankfulness to the gods for what they had been given. And so, secreting an ember within a fennel stone, he brought fire to humanity, a light amidst the darkness of one in a cold season. But the king of the gods was not best pleased that fire 
a power reserved to the gods had been given to created beings. And he wanted a sacrifice, something to prove humans worthy of this great gift. And so Prometheus slaughtered several cows. And being clever, he cleaned and dressed them, and he put the edible meat inside the unattractive exterior of a cow's stomach. And he took the cast off pieces and the bones, and he wrapped them in the beautiful marble hat. He set both of these things on a fire as an offering and bade Zeus choose. And smelling the wonderful smell of cooking fat and seeing the beautiful juice oozing out of the marble, Zeus chose the bones and was displeased. And he said, Very well, humans may have the meat, but the fire will return to Olympus. They may eat it raw. But Prometheus was clever. Prometheus knew that Zeus had said, The fire from Olympus must return to Olympus. And so when the sun rose the next day, he took out a mirror and he focused the rays of Apollo's chariot to a torch. Creating a new light, a new fire, and showing humanity how they might make fire for themselves. Now, some say it is at this point in the story when Zeus punishes Prometheus, but it is not quite that simple. Zeus did call Prometheus to Olympus. Zeus did demand an accounting for this circumlocution of the creed. But what he saw in recompense was a name. Prometheus, the far seer, had foreseen the birth of a half mortal child who would bring about the end of the king of the gods. And Zeus wished that name. But Prometheus had also seen what would become of Zeus, what would become of the world, if that knowledge were had too soon. And he kept his mouth closed. And it was for this that Zeus bound Prometheus to the rock to have his liver eaten daily for eternity. But something terrible happened when Prometheus gone from the world. Humanity made no more problems. They had a light to push back the darkness. They had something to keep them warm when the weather turned cold. But the dreamers saw nothing new. Their leaders did not see past their next moment of crisis. And it was 10 days, maybe 15, into this punishment. When Prometheus began to weep, not for his suffering, not even for the stagnation of his creation, but again, Prometheus had foreseen that Zeus would relent one day and free him that the cost would be high. A mortal champion would be required to break his chains, and an immortal would be required to take his place in the underworld. And Prometheus saw that it would be Chiron, trainer of heroes and teacher of medicine, that would lay down his life in Prometheus' place. And it was for this that he wept for 39 years and change, weeping until his body went dry, only to be magically replenished with his liver each day to weep anew until Heracles came and broke those chains, and Chiron laid down his life and went to the underworld in Prometheus's place. And having done his weeping over those many days and nights, Prometheus spent no more time at it. 
but immediately hugged the son of Zeus in thanks and set forth into the world to give to the dreamers something new, a way to mix the clay and the earth to make better bricks, a way to use those bricks. And just as he had hoped, humanity did more than simply what he gave them. They took those bricks and they built better houses. They built permanent farms in which to cook. He taught them the way to dig pits to make charcoal. They began to make hotter fires, to make copper. And they learned they could thin their bricks, bend them to make tiles so that their roofs would no longer leak after a season of rain. And Prometheus was pleased, but by no means done. He traveled to a place that would come to be known as Athens, where Athena was hard at work teaching the skills of rhetoric, and he partnered with her once again to show the principles of debate, to help humanity see the purpose in organizing. As Athena taught them systems of governance, systems of organization of people, and Hephaestus joined her there, teaching humanity the art of the forge and working metal. While uh, Prometheus showed those first mortal states the working of the bellows to sustain their body. It is in light of this collaboration that perhaps the only known cult of Prometheus is to be found in Athens. Worship alongside Athena, sometimes in the same person with the Hephaestus. There was a great festival called the Prometheus. It began with a torch race from the grove of the academy to the center of the city. Youths would construct their torch and carry it, and the first to arrive would be the winner. But should their torch go out, they would be disqualified. This was a test of skill as well as prowess. Indeed, the torch must be well built. The pace must be such that it would not blow out the flame. This festival will also have games, hymns, and competitive choral singing and gymnastics. It was a glorious time. And with all of this apparatus in place, Prometheus began to travel more broadly. How broadly? It is no mistake. That to this day, things that challenge our perception of what is possible are referred to by the epithet Prometheus. Now it's true that, like any virtue, inspiration can be taken too far. There are any number of stories I did not tell you in their cases in which unconsidered action, because it is possible, leads to tragedy. I suspect more than a few those from the same thing. It is perhaps this power to destroy ourselves that is why Zeus fought so zealously to keep humanity from fighting. But while it is dangerous to us, without the light, we also cannot see how to save ourselves from acting from. By now, you will have noticed that I have told you a story. And I have some things for you to consider. Is a story a ritual? And before you answer, consider Has a story ever changed your mind? Do you? have the power to change the environment around you. And if a ritual is an action undertaken with intent, could telling the right story 
in the right moment be the enacting of the ritual that betters the world. It is not idly I ask you to consider these things. This is the work of Prometheus to take up a light and take it somewhere that it has not previously been. To illuminate something previously thought and see what is there. It is not easy work, especially after two years of isolation, being much more alone than we are accustomed to being. It is hard to imagine. It is hard to be one who imagines in a society that does not prize it. The work of Prometheus is vital. We need dreamers to be our best selves, but it is not. You should take up this work. It will be the work of first finding the source of light and then finding what is it I have not considered. This over here that works. Can I make it better? This over here that has never worked. And fix it. It is a work of self, it is a work of community. This is not the first time that we have considered Prometheus' thinking. Well, it noted, I have not lit a torch and invoked him by epithet, nor have I filled an offering bowl with rich wine. When last we considered Prometheus, the parting message from the divinity was, if you will not take up this torch, do not call. So in order to avoid an obligation we cannot fulfill, I have not done those things, though I will happily be the first among us to pour that rich wine and call those epithets and invite his presence if you choose to. I hope that in this story of the coming of light, the seeing and partial seeing of things previously hidden that your imagination has been sparked, that you have considered something that perhaps you have not performed. And as you return to the temple of all powers, I hope your path is easy and filled with luminous possibility. Thank you for your visit. Thanking the Temple of Prometheus, leaving that shrine behind, we move now to the Temple of Ma'at. This temple made present for you in the South. Welcome to the Temple of Ma'at. I would like to begin by inviting her into our space. Ma'at, daughter of Ra, mistress of heaven, mistress of the two lands, you who grant all life, stability, and power, join us here today. Ma'at, who holds Isfet at bay, be welcome in our space. Ma'at, lover of truth, justice, and harmony, inspire us. Accept this offering of beer and figs. Hail Ma'at. Disinformation. Alternative facts, injustice, imbalance, and chaos. We are plagued by these things that the ancient Egyptians called Isfet. What is the antidote for Isfet? Who can help us restore order and truth? The goddess Ma'at, 
nearly indistinguishable from the concept of ma'at, the opposite of isfet, can inspire us to work toward a better world, especially in an, in, in an election year. The pharaohs of ancient Egypt swore to uphold ma'at, for it was necessary to ensure the floods came on time and the people were prosperous. A pharaoh that didn't uphold ma'at was seen as the cause of famine and strife. Furthermore, ma'at was present when a dead person's heart was weighed. The feather on the other side of the scale was ma'at's, an ostrich feather. While the heart was being weighed, the person re would recite the 42 negative confessions, such as, I have not stolen. Should the person's heart be lighter than the feather, they would pass into the field of reeds, but should it not, they were devoured by Amit. There are seven principles of Ma'at, and these are truth, justice, harmony, balance, order, propriety, and reciprocity. Truth is knowing what is real and unreal. Justice is the state in which there is equity for all persons, for all creatures, and for the planet on which all these depend. Harmony, the state of being in which different expressions of mothers, mother natures and the gods and goddesses and spirits, humans, animals, plants, etc. move together in ways that create alignment and beauty. Balance is a state in which the internal and external environments of an individual or group are aligned with the rest of creation. Order is the opposite of chaos. Reciprocity is the rhythm of cause and effect, give and take, forward and background, backward in every aspect of creation. And propriety is the means to be and to do what is right according to the truth that all living creatures are spiritual beings and deserve to exist. This means to do no harm to another being, including oneself. I'd like to take an opportunity for us to do some work for Ma'at, an offering for her. So I'd like to take him, have you take a moment to think, how have you upheld one or more of the principles of Ma'at recently? There are feathers being passed around that you can write on. And you'll note that this is, this is an ostrich feather, which is on the top of Ma'at's head in most depictions of her. And on this ostrich feather, I invite you to write one of the ways that you have upheld one or more of the principles of Ma'at. You can do more than one if you choose. There should be plenty for you to do more than one if you would like to. And when you have finished writing that down, we will gather those up and they will be given to the earth as a way of giving them to Ma'at. And when folks are finished, We'll take down this image, and that way uh, I'll know that we're ready to, to move on.
Thank you for taking the time to make offering to Ma'at. Should Gaia Community choose Ma'at as its patron? We would want to honor her by by continuing to uphold Ma'at in our lives and as our and as a community, but also we would work to increase the amount of Ma'at in the world. So we would work to tell the truth in places where people are outright lying. We would work to uh, increase justice in all kinds of justice, which is something we already do, which is sounds very convenient, but there's probably more we could do. And that would be something that would be good. Um, and I think that it would be important for us to um, look at the balance of our lives and make sure that we are maintaining that balance, the various kinds of balance that we can have, things like work versus life, or how we interact with the community and how we keep up our personal spirituality. And so um, those were things, those are things that we would want to do should we choose Ma'at. And I believe that if we were to choose Ma'at, that um, she would inspire us to do more of those things and also help us to gather energy and direct energy towards a more non-ISFET way of life in our country. So I appreciate that, that people have come to the temple today and I appreciate that you have made offering to Ma'at and we would like to thank Ma'at now. Ma'at, great goddess, Thank you for your presence here today. May we continue to honor you in all our thoughts, words, and actions. Hail Ma'at. Ma Let us leave the shrine of Ma'at. Let us return here and now. I ask you once again, focus on the plane of our chalice. Let this single point of light fill your awareness. Let this light grow, leading you back here into our space and time together, allowing the temple of many powers to fade from your awareness, knowing that you can return and visit again anytime you like. I invite you to move and stretch. Be present here in your own body, in your own space. As we finish our ritual together, again, we thank the cotton, we thank the world tree, we thank Prometheus and Ma'at, and I thank all of you for being here with us today as we learn more about these powers who may become our patrons. Thank you all. So I now open time for announcements. Next week, we celebrate the summer solstice. We will be celebrating an Egyptian tradition next week, uh, observing the Festival of Beautiful Reunions. We'll be honoring uh, Horus and Hathor. And uh, we will be uh, continuing a bit on Jamie's theme of uh, campaigning against his fet and disorder. Is there anything else going on? Uh, yeah, Aaron, go ahead. Uh, 
Tuesday is social justice meeting. Uh, seven on Zoom. Tuesday is social justice, seven on Zoom. It's the third week of the month. We've got games on Friday and ritual for business on Saturday. Very busy week. Very busy week. Uh, anything else? Uh, yes, if you are a ritualist or other concerned person, <laughs> we will turn away now. I am concerned about our ritual closet. It is full of things. It is full of things we have not seen in two plus years, and it is scary. Uh, so after our ritual for business on Saturday, uh, we'll be gathering here in the space to begin cleaning and reorganizing the closet. Um, putting yep. in new shelves. Thank you, Dennis. A new shelf. Uh, getting our tech part together so that we can be a little bit uh, more prepared in that way. So, uh, anyone who wants to come by and help out is totally welcome to do that. We will also be doing this on Monday afternoon. Uh, so, if you are available, there. Well, so we're off, so continuing to come then. Uh, not, not tomorrow. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. Eight um, days from now. Eight days from now. Uh, on, on the point. Um, so yeah, if we can get any assistance at all for that, that's amazing, um, and we'll, we'll all be better for it. I now invite you to Yes, David is going to put a link in the chat uh, for those who are joining us online that will show you a link to how to support the IAC community and a link to our ongoing Harvester's Food Bank campaign that we certainly support. Uh, if you are here with us in the space, um, now we just want us to take the offerings. I'm going to vaguely wave a leaf in your direction, and if you need to pay your bill to make an offering, you might want to Question. Yeah. Is there a link to the Harvester? Is the link to the Harvester's thing on the back side? It is? Yes. I need that on the course. You can find us on our website at our community Now, into this time to end our time together. So, uh, we can say, or we can come and say all of our closing words. Uh, so, I would like to say our, all of our closing words uh, in a call and response kind of voice. So, we invite you to. By the earth that is her body. By the earth that is her body. And the grove that is his home. And the grove that is his home. By the air that is her breath. And the music of his song. And, and the, the music, music of, of his, his song. song. By the fire of her bright spirit. By, by the, the fire, fire of her bright spirit. And the heat of his passion. And, and the heat, heat of, of his passion. passion. By the waters of her living womb. By the waters of her living womb. And the dew that is his tears. And, and the dew that is his tears. tears. This circle is open but unbroken. This circle is open and unbroken. May the peace of the goddess go in our hearts. May, May the peace of the goddess go in our hearts. And the dance of the god enliven our days. And the dance of the god enliven our, our days. May we care for the earth and each other. And may we care for the earth and each other. Because our lives depend on it. Because our lives depend on it. Merry meet. Merry parts. And merry meet again. Thank you, everyone. See you next week.